All right, welcome back. So let's think a little bit more about independent two sample tests. All right, so remember the big issue that we ran into here was usually we're not going to know about the normality of both of these populations. Specifically, we're probably not going to know their two variances or standard deviations. All right, so what we did was just like with one sample, we can use S to estimate sigma. Here, we're using S1 to estimate S2. Or sorry, we're using S1 to estimate sigma 1, S2 to estimate sigma 2. Right, which gave us a standard, a standard error that looked like this. This is really only a good way to do it right, if the variances of these two groups are different. Okay, what if the variances of these two groups are the same, or at least pretty close? Well, let's think about this idea called pooling. All right, remember what we're trying to do. S1 should be an estimate of sigma, of sigma 1. In other words, S1 squared should be an estimate of sigma 1 squared, and so forth for the second group. What if the two variances are the same? Just call it, call it sigma squared. Well then, these should both be estimates of the same thing. So if these are both estimates of the same thing, we can put those estimates together with this process called pooling. All right, how do we know that? Well, we're never going to know if they're exactly the same. Right, but a quick, easy way of saying are they close enough to each other is are the ratio of these two variances between one half and two. Now you can do a formal hypothesis test to see are these are these the same or are they close enough to each other, and we may we may look into that more in the future. Right, but for now we can just kind of use these quick, easy guidelines as the ratio between these variances between one half and two. Again, something to think about here, what if I flip-flop these? Does it matter if I flip-flop these? No, because two and one half are reciprocals of each other. Okay, so what we've been looking at before in our last application video is actually we were assuming unequal variances or this that's what's oftentimes called an unpooled two sample t-test, right? Remember we've seen this test statistic before, right? So what we were doing is unpooled. That's kind of the safe route, right? An unpooled confidence interval is what we saw before as well. All right, let's, let's expand on this unpooled idea a little bit. So we know kind of what this idea of pooled versus unpooled is. So unpooled is what we looked at before in our previous application. Right? And remember for our degrees of freedom, right? we said let's just go with the safe estimate. Let's just go with what we called our conservative estimate. Right? That's actually what's, what's been called Welch's approximation. Well actually most software and the, the technical way of doing this is we can use what's called Satterwhite's degrees of freedom. Now it's this big ugly formula and if I were sitting down to do this by hand there's there's no way that that we would want to deal with this. All right, but that's how most softwares are going to do it. So if you're sitting here doing it by hand, I would suggest doing it the conservative estimate way. All right, but don't be surprised if you plug it into software that it gives you some other degrees of freedom. All right? This is what most software are going to use for an unpooled test for degrees of freedom. All right, what about a going back to our idea of pooling? What do we use for the pooled variance? Well, here's how you calculate your pooled variance. All right, so my pooled variance is this. My pooled standard deviation, of course, is just going to be square root of that. All right, so how do we deal with our, so remember, this degrees of freedom here was unpooled. Now we're going to have to deal with degrees of freedom for a pooled t-test differently. But degrees of freedom for a pooled t-test is way, way easier. All right, remember, 
n1 minus 1, so think about doing this, n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1, that gives us n1 plus n2 minus 2. All right, so our degrees of freedom is way easier when things are pooled, but the calculation of the pooled standard deviation is kind of a pain in the butt. All right, so our sampling distribution with a pooled t-test is going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to set my test statistic up different for a pooled t-test. I'm going to set my confidence interval up a little bit different for a pooled two-sample t-test. All right, remember what our test statistic looks like? Assuming equal variances and pooling, right, our standard error, our denominator, is going to look different. Our degrees of freedom will be this. But a pooled confidence interval, right? we know what the format looks like. Assuming equal variances, pooling, assuming this is our sampling distribution, here's what our confidence interval will look like. Okay, so let's try to sum everything up here, where we're, what we're thinking about with two samples. All right, so if I see that I have two samples of quantitative data, really the first thing that I'm going to think about, is there some sort of relationship here, right? If I can match people up, I'm going to treat it as matched pairs. The analysis there is a little bit easy, right? Because matched pairs, it's basically treating our differences like a single sample. All right, if I'm treating it as two independent samples, right, maybe I can use Z, but that's not going to be very often, right? Most of the time, we're going to be using two sample independent t-tests. Right? Technically, when I'm doing a two sample independent t-test, the default option on most things is just treat them as, un as unequal variances, don't pull. But pooling is going to give us more accurate, more precise results, really. Okay, so let's try to sum up kind of our, our pooling decision. Right, so remember, if, we, if we're saying that our, the variances of our two groups are not the same, right, then pooling doesn't really help us. We'll say, no, we're not going to pool. Our standard error is this. If I'm not pooling, I have to make a decision on my degrees of freedom. And most of the time, if I'm just sitting down doing it pencil and paper, I'll just use the conservative estimate. Right? But if we want to be more precise, and this is how computers will do it. They'll use that Satterwhite's degrees of freedom. All right, so again, what do we mean by equal variances? It doesn't mean that these variances or the sample variances have to be exactly the same. Right? All we got to do is check is the ratio between the two close enough, between one half and two. All right, then pooling may be helpful. If I decide I'm going to pool, I, my standard error is this, it's that pooled standard deviation. All right, so that's, there's a, a lot that goes into the calculation of that, All right, but my degrees of freedom is going to be much easier. All right, my degrees of freedom is just N1 plus N2. All right, some other side notes about all these T procedures that we're using. All right, so remember we have that underlying assumption to use your t distribution, we should technically, our, our data should come from a normal population. And yes, that's true. And it's especially true with one sample t stuff. All right. But with two sample t stuff, right, two sample t procedures are, are very robust. All right. This word robust, the more robust something is, the less sensitive it is to violations of assumptions. All right, so remember our assumptions is that things are coming from a normal population. But if I'm comparing two groups, really I just need the populations of those groups to be similar with two sample T procedures. All right, and these two sample T procedures work even for small samples. Right, the two populations just need to look similar. They have to have similar shapes. They don't even necessarily have to be normal. And this works better. Now I don't... I don't want to have an imbalance here. I don't want to have one sample big and one sample small. I want similar sample sizes and similar populations. But for two sample T, they're pretty robust. We don't have to have exact normality. All right, so thanks for tuning in. And we'll check out an application of this in the next video.